Welcome to District Deep Dive, where we take a look at the history, culture, and political climate of each of Panem's 13 districts. Today, we'll be taking a closer look at District 8, Panem's textile production center, home to all your beloved funky capital fashions, and the birthplace of the Second Rebellion. District 8 is described in book as being an urban place stinking of industrial fumes, the people housed in run-down tenements. Barely a blade of grass in sight, stretching over what is modern-day Kansas, Missouri, southern Illinois, and Tennessee. Its highly industrialized setting is especially fitting, considering the fact that it's among Panem's larger districts, boasting a population of 122,000, the majority of which staff 43 textile processing and production factories. However, in spite of its large population, District 8 appears to have been given quotas virtually impossible to meet, with catching fire insinuating that it is mandatory for all citizens, including children, to work a minimum four-hour factory shift on top of their other jobs and responsibilities. This labor requirement is also interpreted as members of District 8 simply lacking sufficient pay to purchase the day-to-day -day items necessary for survival, making their multiple jobs a necessity instead of an officially imposed requirement. Being a highly industrialized district whose export doesn't exactly supply essential survival or self-defense skills is a catastrophically unfortunate combination. With District 8 tributes appearing to struggle in the games to the point the capital actually dresses them as court gestures during the victory parade. The male tribute, who most likely has never climbed anything in his entire life, given that trees themselves are described as being rare in 8, injures himself in a fall during training to the point that his leg is still bound during the start of the games. The female tribute is outright deemed by Katniss to be the biggest idiot in the games, starting a fire seemingly unaware of the fact that doing so is synonymous with shouting your location from the rooftops. And yet although setting a fire is clearly a foolish action, we can still greatly sympathize with this tribute due to the fact that she's likely never known cold, with there being this tragedy to her pursuit of the warmth that she's known her entire life being the exact thing that alerts the careers to her location. Although their consistent failure could be considered due to individual tributes' personal lack of common sense, the plight of District 8 tributes raise the question, how can you ready yourself for something you've never seen? Furthermore, the children of District 8 likely experience high rates of childhood injury. Take a look at Bobbin, from the Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes, who is missing an arm. The kind of sweatshops that District 8 children work in are notoriously dangerous to the extent that a child losing a finger, hand, or arm would not be an uncommon occurrence. There's even historical precedence for this. During the Industrial Revolution, it was not uncommon for children to be employed for dangerous tasks like crawling under machinery to gather up cotton. Losing fingers or hands was actually on the lighter side of the spectrum of injury. Many children were outright decapitated. However, their lack of exposure to natural terrain and weaponry doesn't hinder the creativity or resourcefulness of District 8 citizens, with a tribute from one year mentioning numerous ways in which you could kill someone with a sewing needle. Nor does the destitution and poverty of their surroundings keep citizens of District 8 from striving towards a better, more hopeful future. A fantastic example of this can be found in District 8 Victor Cecilia, the only victor at the time of the third quarter quell described as having children. Although this appears to be a minor detail intended to cement how cruel the third quarter quell reapings are, to me, it's a fantastic testament to her optimism and hope for the future, with her being able to conceive a world in which her children could flourish after enduring a terrible atrocity. Despite being forced to relive that same atrocity year after year, Cecilia looks to the future, refusing to allow the horror of her circumstances to strip her of the kind, gentle, nurturing person she is at her core. And it's this exact drive and determination we see continuously reflected in the citizens of District 8. This same drive and determination is once again witnessed throughout Katniss's victory tour, which incites civil unrest in a wide array of districts, including District 8. During the night that Peta proposed to Katniss, the citizens of Eight rose up against and overwhelmed their peacekeeper force in large droves, successfully capturing the communication center, the armory, the justice building, and the peacekeeper's headquarters in an incredible display that had the potential to officially mark the start of the Second Rebellion. However, their incredible victory is ultimately short-lived, with the capital retaliating by deploying thousands of peacekeepers and hovercraft to bomb rebel strongholds. At the same time, a district-wide lockdown was forcibly implemented. All citizens were locked away in their homes without food or coal for roughly one week, all factories and plants being temporarily shut down as peacekeepers attempted to round up and execute suspected rebels, with said executions being publicly broadcasted on the entrapped citizens' TVs and for a long while being the only footage they could access. And, for a final display to District 8 as to what happens to those who rebel, upon learning which factory talk of the rebellion first emerged in, the capital blows it up with every worker inside. A final act intended to cement the idea this is the consequence the mere talk of uprising naturally incites. You would imagine with such devastating sudden losses, District 8's spirit would be crushed, but you'd be mistaken. 
Even in the immediate aftermath of the factory bombing, ordinary citizens such as Bonnie and Twill cling to the dream of revolution more powerfully than ever before, outright fleeing the familiarity of eight in pursuit of District 13, which at this point in the narrative may as well be a bad urban legend. And yet although to them, there's no concrete proof of 13's existence, the mere prospect and promise of a place where resistance will flourish is enough to spur the pair onward, undertaking a massive, arduous journey requiring both to risk life and limb. Such a sentiment that just the idea of a potential rebel stronghold is worth dying for is one District 8 continues expressing well after the point that District 13's existence is confirmed. Even in the most hopeless of circumstances, the citizens of District 8 are unrelenting in their fight to secure a freer, better future with them being the first district to fully overthrow capital rule, which to some poses the question that if they are so disadvantaged in the games, how have they then managed to make themselves such vital assets in the rebellion? To answer that, let's take a look at the basics. District 8's workers predominantly work in factories, which likely generate noise to the point that conversation cannot be captured through ordinary means of surveillance. Given the fact that factories are the sole areas in which the citizens can gather in large numbers and speak without consequence, they are the perfect place to discreetly plan a potential uprising. Equally advantageous is the immense knowledge citizens of District 8 have accrued in regards to the way that people think and behave due to the fact their work efficiency is contingent on their ability to communicate and collaborate with their peers, each working as one part of a massive whole. While they lack any formal weaponry, their strategy alone is strong to the point they can surpass seemingly insurmountable odds. The idea of functioning as equally valuable, important parts of a whole is prevalent in their interactions with rebels and rulers beyond their district as well. When Katniss visits the hospital in District 8, despite having catastrophic injuries of their own, the citizens still express concern and sympathy over Katniss's false miscarriage. When contemplating a way in which to crack the nut, Commander Paler refuses to allow her soldiers to be placed in a position where they would be used as cannon fodder. Despite their immense suffering, they seemingly only wish to attain a true republic with Paler instructing soldiers not to take out their vengeance on capital citizens, a belief system that makes their commander Paler a perfect president to run the Republic following Snow's fall, installing the fair and free government her people laid down their lives to build. Thank you all for taking this tour of Panem with us, and if you enjoyed, please make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. And here's an extra special thank you to our Patreons. What we do would not be possible without your support. If you would like to consider joining them, the link is in the description. Thank you all so much for your time, and have a wonderful day. May the odds be ever in your favor.